disclaimer. I apologize that this ended up being so damn long, but it really couldn't be helped. Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. Zexizi has made a response to me, so let's take a look at it. Two and a half minutes long, I... In response to a 20 minute video, I... <sighs> The USSR was socialist because the economic mechanisms didn't perpetuate inequality, like the concentration of capital into private hands of individuals who used it to increase their social position, because the profits went to the state. <laughs> you, you hear that guys? Profits went to the state. Now, in Jason's defense, like, let's be real, you know what he means, right? He worded it poorly, but he shouldn't have said profit, he should have said surplus. And he should have said society as a whole and not the state. But he pretty clearly says that the wealth of the society was used not for profits of private individuals, but to benefit society as a whole and the people. That's so... Jason, you do realize that in admitting that, you're essentially completely negating any notion that the USSR may have been socialist. To say that there were profits to begin with. Now, Soviet socialism, especially under the five year plans, created a new, never before seen way of extracting a surplus, a non capitalist way of doing it. Oh, a socialist way of extracting surplus value. Holy he didn't say surplus value, he said surplus. There's always surplus. Now, in the critique of the Gotha program, Marx says that, of course, workers will receive the necessary goods like food and whatever that they need from the state and from the society. You know, we, we understand that this must happen. People must get these necessary goods, right? But there's this thing called the total social product. That is the sum of everything that is produced in society. Now, the Lasallians and Proudhon supporters and all these utopians and petty bourgeois socialists they were saying that we need to produce and then we will equally divide all the value so that everyone gets quote unquote the undiminished proceeds of labor or everybody gets the exact value that they deserve and Marx spends a great deal of time talking about this and basically the whole commodity production part it deals more with this problem than with commodity production exactly because the whole thing that Marx is saying in this pretty long argument is that no you won't get the exact thing you deserve instead part of the total social product will be used to give people necessary goods like food which needs to happen what needs to be deducted from this he says quote from this must now be deducted first cover for replacement of the means of production used up second additional portion for expansion of production third reserve or insurance funds to provide against accidents, dislocations caused by natural calamities, etc. These deductions from the quote-unquote undiminished proceeds of labor are an economic necessity, and their magnitude is to be determined according to available means and forces, and partly by computation of probabilities, but they are in no way calculable by equity. And then he says, there remains the other part of the total product intended to serve as means of consumption. End of quote. So, let me ask you this. What is surplus value? You work for a certain period, and that is the value that you produce that is equivalent to the wage you get. And surplus value is the value of the work that you perform on top of the value you get in your wage, right? But what Marx is saying in this pretty long part of the critique of the Gotha program is that there will be a surplus. It is in fact necessary that there will be a surplus. People will produce enough to feed themselves, clothe themselves, and do all this stuff, but they also need to produce a surplus, which is used to, you know, maintain the level of productivity they already have, repair things, have a, some kind of insurance fund against accidents. He talks about schools, health services. He says, quote, the general cost of administration not belonging to production, unquote. That would be state employees, you know, Stalinist bureaucracy, you know, the state administration, and all that. So, of course, there needs to be a surplus. So, I think you're just nitpicking. He used the word surplus, and you're like, ah, oh, surplus value, but it doesn't mean that. I'm fairly certain, Jason, you haven't even seen my video. The thing about Jason's video is, and this is the last comment I make about this, he just reiterates the basic argument about why the USSR is social. But whatever, let's move on to the part where you actually respond to me. I want to make a clarification because in the last video I made, I implied that Zigzizi was not, or 
I gave the impression that I thought Zigzizi was not honest in his views. I think he's honest. I think he genuinely believes what he's saying. But I think the people who originated these views are not honest. I don't think the left comms who came up with these arguments, which Zigzizi is now using, I don't think they could honestly come to those conclusions without wanting to. What I mean by that is that they already decided that they don't like the Soviet Union and they wanted to come up with a reason to justify that. The first off, class property. Now, while this isn't a point that Finball specifically responded to, it's still very relevant to lots of other themes that come up in his argument throughout the video. Um, and while I did explain this in my original video, I am starting to think that maybe I wasn't that clear about it. So basically what I'm going to do now is just straight up uh, read the section of the article that I got this from. I think this is a bit unnecessary considering that you already used the same article as your source in the last video. The first form of capitalist collective Marx discerns in share capital, showing the separation between ownership of means of production and the process of production itself where within the capitalist mode of production itself, there occurs the abolition of private property in the means of production. Again, I don't think anyone could honestly make this kind of argument. Like, whatever, Zigzizi makes it in good faith, but the guy who wrote this, like, I just don't believe that anyone would honestly hold views like this. Share capital, which then shows the separation of ownership of means of production and the relation of production. No. And he talks about share capital. I would say that you're being rather undialectical here, because like a stock company or something which is owned by a bunch of capitalists, it exploits labor, it does all the things that a normal capitalist corporation does, but a collective farm doesn't do any of that. And then if we take the most extreme example, all right, let's take a co-op in capitalism and compare it to a co-op in socialism, all right? So what does a co-op in capitalism do? I agree with you that if you have a co-op in capitalism, then that is not socialism, of course not, because it's just one co-op. It is totally under the control of capitalist market forces and has to compete on the market and do all these things. Now, this would be a good argument against like anarchists who really romanticize co-ops, but this is not a good argument against Leninism. Let's look at a cooperative in socialism, shall we? And for the sake of this, let's let's look at the Soviet Union specifically. In socialism, in the Soviet Union, when they had cooperatives, that meant the end of private property. It wasn't just one co-op in a sea of capitalist enterprises and market forces and stuff like that. No, it meant the implementation of socialism, the abolition of private property. Now, co-ops and collectives are not communism, they are socialism. They're very much characteristic of the lower phase where we are transitioning towards something better. They were never meant to be the end-all, be-all, and I totally agree with you on that. This is a rather Stalinist, like, argument you're making. I've made an argument against co-ops myself, because there's people who really romanticize co-ops and think they're like the, yeah, we're gonna have stateless communism with co-ops. No, of course not. You can have socialism with, that has co-ops in it, but you can't have communism that has co-ops in it. I know uh, Comrade Hakim made a video about co-ops. I'm gonna put the link in the description. So this is rather a an argument against like those Richard Wolf type utopians or um, anarchists or something. And in the Soviet Union, the collective farms, they owned their own production buildings and they owned the buildings where the people lived, but those are not means of production, they're just where they live. And they didn't own the land, the land was nationalized, so it was owned by the state. They owned their own seed and they owned their own product. The seeds are kind of a means of production, but the product is not. And then they used the machines, but they didn't own the machines. The machines were given by the state for free. So to me, to compare a co-op, a collective farm like that, to like a stock company or something, just because there's a group of people who own it, that is just idiotic, to be honest. And the whole argument like, all right, this demonstrates the, the separateness of the productive relations versus the ownership relation, the property relation. Property relation in the Soviet Union was of course different from capitalism, but so was the productive relation. Finally, theoretically it would be possible for there to be a state capitalism where the state owns everything, but it's still capitalism. Where there's exploitation, where there's wage labor, profit motive, and stuff like that. Yeah, it would be possible, but that's not what the Soviet Union was. When Marx talks about that, he's talking about this like super hypothetical which has never happened 
But yeah, theoretically it would be possible, he's absolutely correct. But that is not what the Soviet Union was. And in a practical sense, we have already moved beyond this, because like when Marx was writing this, for him a capitalist was this one guy who owns one factory. Now, this is a rather old definition. We've all moved away from this definition already. Like, we know there can be these massive multinationals that are owned by a hundred millionaire stock owners and not just by a single capitalist. This is not something like cutting-edge stuff that you're bringing forward here. In a practical sense, we all understand this. In a practical sense, we understand this to such a level that we don't even consider this as a separate thing anymore. Like, we don't talk about, ooh, capitalist collective property. No, we just call it private property, because that's really what it is. And to compare this with a collective farm or something, again, to, to me, it just sounds ridiculous. The state itself, as a capitalist producer with its product as a commodity. Though it's employment of productive wage labor. And again, productive wage labor. The Soviet Union didn't have wage labor, but we'll get to that later on. On the other hand, capitalist private property has another and more profound meaning in Marx and Engels, which does not figure in Lenin's discussion. Yeah, 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 we all know Lenin was just an idiot. This random Libcom article knows everything much better than Lenin. Like, pfft, what did Lenin ever accomplish? He should just... Lenin, sit down, take notes, alright? There's a real genius who's talking here. So just watch and learn, Lenin, you moron. Abolition of private property, the latter is expressly used in the sense of disappearance of class property. In the same vein, Marx writes almost two and a half decades later, Yes, gentlemen, the commune intends to abolish class property, which makes the labor of the many the wealth of the few. Please, listen to yourself, okay? It says, on the other hand, capitalist private property has another and more profound meaning in Marx and Engels. What is this more profound meaning he's talking about? This more profound meaning is that everything should, in the end, be public property owned by the society as a whole. Again, that is a Stalinist argument. And, you know, I use the term Stalinist a bit ironically, but I just mean that it's an argument that Stalin made. Yeah, I agree. Everyone agrees with this. This is not a more profound meaning. We all literally agree with this. All the extrapolations that this Libcom article makes based on this, I don't agree with any of that. But I agree with what Marx is saying that everything should be public property in communism, not co-op property. I've said this a million times already, co-ops can be socialist, but not communist. But I'm not one of those big co-op fetishists anyway. And then, listen to this very carefully. Marx says, Yes, gentlemen, the commune intends to abolish class property, which makes the labor of the many the wealth of the few, unquote. Now, ask yourself this. Did collective farms in the Soviet Union did they make the labor of the many the wealth of the few? In other words, did they have exploiters? No, they didn't. The wealth of the many benefited the many. When he says that they want to abolish property that makes the labor of the many the wealth of the few, he's talking about abolishing capitalists, exploiters, which was done in the Soviet Union, in, in socialism. So, to reiterate, Marx seeks the abolition of class property, that being any property used to produce commodities. I just want everyone to keep that in mind as we go through Finnish Bolsheviks arguments during this video because it's something that will be relevant a lot. We all understand that commodity production should be stopped in communism. You can still have commodities and you can still have exchange in socialism but not in full communism because that's the point of full communism that we get rid of all these things that are still part of the, you know, the lower phase of communism stamped with the birthmarks both economic and moral of capitalism. I'm not a market socialist. I'm not a Proudhon supporter. I'm not a Bakunin supporter. I'm not one of those guys who says that, oh yeah, we should have trade indefinitely. No, it should be abolished eventually. But I'm not going to sit there and say like, oh, if you, if you have planning and you have collective farms and no private property, but if you still have trade, then it's not real socialism. Saying that is just an insane vulgarization of Marx. Even Stalin admits that the law of value must exist where there is commodity production. Yet, as I've just explained, value cannot exist under social. You can have social labor, which produces a, you know, the total social product, which then if you distribute it, and the way you choose to distribute it is by selling those things, then they are commodities. 
yeah, it's not the same kind of commodity production as in capitalism, but that should be fairly obvious anyway, because it's not capitalism, it's socialism. You know, in the Soviet Union, they said everyone is paid according to their work. So they uh, work according to their ability and they earn according to their work. If you work for six hours, you get paid for six hours, you can buy means of consumption. Now, the labor would be social, but when you sell those goods, I think you have to call them commodities. Then Stalin says about the law of value, where there's commodities, to that extent, in that limited sphere, there also has to be value. He says that the law of value is not a regulating force in socialism, and it cannot be. When we're about to see that Engels says value doesn't exist under socialism, surely this must tell you that the USSR is not socialist. It will still be necessary for society to know how much labor each article of consumption requires for its production. People will be able to manage everything very simply without the intervention of much vaunted value. Yeah, I mean, again, this is a Stalinist argument. Stalin says, quote, True, the law of value has no regulating function in our socialist production. That is literally exactly what Engels is saying. For socialism, which wants to emancipate human labor power from its status as a commodity, the realization that labor has no value and can have none is of great importance. I don't think you understand what you're reading. You should have read Stalin's book before you made this. It would be useful for you to know the other side's argument before you argue against it, you know? I even said this in my, my first video, but this is what Stalin says in his book, The Economic Problems of Socialism in the Soviet Union. Quote, The system of wage labor no longer exists, and labor power is no longer a commodity. Unquote. And again, that is exactly what Engels is saying. We want to emancipate labor power from its status of a commodity, that is, from wage labor. The USSR did exactly that. Labor was not a commodity anymore. I would also like to point out that he says, for socialism, which wants to do this and that. He's talking about socialism as an ideology. He's not talking about the socialist mode of production. I'm just putting that out there for the sake of clarity. And of course, I'd imagine it follows from there that if labor has no value, then the law of value does not exist. No. Because if one thing doesn't have value, that doesn't mean that something else couldn't have value. Just because labor is not a commodity, that doesn't mean that other things can't be commodities. And honestly, you really don't understand what you're reading. Because Engels is not saying the law of value can't function in socialism or something like that. He's saying something much, much more basic. He's saying that products can have value, the labor commodity can have value, but labor itself cannot. And as he says, this is ideologically significant, very important. Quote, value itself is nothing else than the expression of the socially necessary human labor materialized in an object. Labor can therefore have no value. One might as well speak of the value of value, or try to determine the weight not of a heavy body, but of heaviness itself, as speak of the value of labor, and try to determine it. For socialism, which wants to emancipate human labor power from its status as a commodity, the realization that labor has no value and can have none is of great importance." Unquote. And not to be like overtly smug, but I think it's pretty hilarious and ironic that it's you who has not realized this, and not me. The quotes I've given here show that to say that commodity production can exist under socialism is in direct contradiction with what Marx and Engels say. No. What they really show is that you can't read. If, of course, you accept that commodity production necessitates the existence of the law of value, which you do. This is then completely ignoring the fact that exchange of means of consumption under socialism for these labor vouchers has no uh, profit generation or capital accumulation at all. No profit and no accumulation? What do you mean? I don't know about the term profit. Like, do, do you mean surplus value? Do you mean capitalist profit, or do you mean profit in general, as in surplus of any kind? Because like I already explained to you, of course there will be surplus, and of course there will even be accumulation. I don't know where you get the idea that there won't be any accumulation. I quote Marx again, he says, quote, There remains the other part of the total product intended to serve as means of consumption. Before this is divided among the individuals, there has to be deducted again from it. First, the general cost of administration not belonging to production, the surplus, or the profit, if you will. I'm talking about profit very generally as a surplus, not something that is the result of exploitation. If you take an apple, you get the seed, you plant it, you get a tree, and then you get a bunch of apples. If your original apple was only one, and now you got a tree that has ten apples, 
you've made nine profit. I'm using the word profit in that general sense of surplus, not in the sense of exploitation. There has to be surplus, there has to be profit in this sense, which is then used for the cost of administration, social services. He even says, quote, additional portion for the expansion of production. How are you going to expand if you don't make any profit or any surplus? You can't. You would just stay exactly where you are. The only way you can expand production is if you have accumulation. To quote Stalin, this is what he says, quote, Is there a basic economic law of socialism? Yes, there is. What are the essential features and requirements of this law? The essential features and requirements of the basic law of socialism might be formulated roughly in this way. The securing of the maximum satisfaction of the constantly rising material and cultural requirements of the whole of society through the continuous expansion and perfection of socialist production on the basis of higher techniques. End of quote. I'm sure he read the critique of the Goth program very carefully because this is so similar that I'm sure that it's formulated on top of that. I'm going to leave two articles in, in the description. Uh, don't link the same two articles that we already saw in the other video. They even somewhat contradict what Zigzizi is saying. One thing, for example, that this article says, which kinda gives you an indication of why you should be at least somewhat mindful of what is actually being said instead of just what the words are that are being used. You should understand the context somewhat to understand what is actually the point that's being made instead of just seeing the words. Like, there won't be any exchange, therefore not real socialism. For example, in this article it says, Marx tells us that, quote, as a general rule, articles of utility become commodities only because they are products of the labor of private individuals or groups of individuals who carry on their work independently of each other, unquote. By that logic, the Soviet Union wouldn't have commodity production at all, because there were no private individuals producing separately from each other. There were groups of individuals, but even they didn't produce independently of each other. They produced according to a plan. He continues and says, quote, Only in the social situation where the connection of social labor appears as manifested in the private exchange of individual products, does the labor expended on the product appear as the value of this product and as a material quality that this product has, unquote. Now, by that logic, the Soviet Union wouldn't have the law of value either, because it talks about private exchange of individual products. But that didn't happen. There was no private exchange nor was there really exchange of individual products. But at the beginning of this explanation, as a caveat, Marx says, as a general rule, meaning in most cases, usually, in the typical case. Now, of course, the Soviet Union was not typical, because it wasn't capitalism. So I would just like to complicate things a little bit, instead of just saying, therefore not real socialism. Like, it's not as simple as that. To me, it's pretty obvious that they had commodity production, even though under this criteria they didn't, but I would say that it's pretty clear they did. Quote, I think that we must also discard certain other concepts taken from Marx's capital, where Marx was concerned with an analysis of capitalism and artificially applied to our socialist relations. Marx analyzed capitalism. It is natural that Marx used concepts, categories, which fully corresponded to capitalist relations, but it is strange to say the least to use these concepts now." Unquote. This is really what this boils down to. Almost always Marx is talking about capitalism, and usually even in a pretty abstract sense. Now what Lenin and Stalin are talking about is socialism in a very concrete sense, and then wherever there is like a disconnect between those two, the left communists will jump in and say, oh, not real socialism. You should look at the substance of Marx and the meaning behind Marx instead of nitpicking like this. Especially what has become so abundantly clear, like when Marx talks about communism, he doesn't specify is this lower or higher communism. Left comms almost always argue that no, 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 this has to already happen in the lower phase of communism. Whereas we Leninists would say that no, that sounds like higher phase of communism. And because of things like that, they will then turn around and say, not real socialism. And that is why I'm saying that you should understand the context in which something is being said to understand what it really means. Usually it doesn't really work if you just separate this one individual sentence from its context in discussions like this. Finbo, I, I implore you to read these, I really do.
I looked at them already when you made your first video, and then when you sent me the... I don't remember if you sent me both of them or just one, but I, I read it. I think you should read more of Lenin's commentary on Marx, and what Lenin has to say, than some random Libcom article, or some random Trotskyist article, the sole point of which is just to twist Marx's words to come to the conclusion that the Soviet Union was evil state capitalist. It's not useful, it's not useful in the slightest. And while you're at it, you could also read Stalin's book on economics. I mean, honestly, it's pretty fascinating. And so is Lenin's later writings, because they talk about how do we actually make socialism happen. Well, uh, Vinish Bolshevik um, quoted several parts from Critique of the Gopher Program. I, I just felt like he was misunderstanding these and misusing these a bit. So the feeling is somewhat mutual. So the first quote that he uh, brings up is, In the society based on the common ownership of the means of production, producers do not exchange their products. Well, I brought that up because you brought it up. And Finbol tells us that we shouldn't be taking this literally, and I do ask, how should we take it? Uh we should take it in the argument that he's making. What I mean by that is, when you have these Lasallian utopians who say, we should just have a system where everybody gets exactly the value they want and we exchange and every exchange is fair. Marx says, no, the point of communism is not to create a system where exchange happens but it's fair and a system where value is divided but it's fair. The point of communism is to eventually abolish all that. That's what he's saying. But what you're doing is you're seeing there's no exchange. Therefore, if they have exchange, it's not socialism. That is a gross vulgarization of what he says. The second part of the quote is only talking about labor being directly social, and that's explaining why exchange to begin with doesn't exist anymore. A transition from private to social labor is the method that commodities take on to relate to society, and, and it's that exchange that they make. So therefore, when, directly is, or when labor is already directly social, you no longer have any exchange, because you don't need to exchange things anymore. Things are already social. You just don't call it exchange. Like, we're talking about distribution, and you don't call it exchange, but Marx calls it exchange. So it's just kind of weird of you to take him so literally in another part, but not at all literally in another part. He uses the word exchange. Now, I would say, for the sake of clarity, we should call it distribution, but then how that relates to commodity production is that if this distribution happens according to payment, then they are goods being sold which in my opinion are commodities. And that is by, again, transitioning from private to social labor. I think Mexi summed this up really well. She said, labor is already directly social. How? And what does that look like practically? Exactly. You just keep repeating that as if it's some kind of good answer. This is a very metaphysical way of looking at this. You just keep throwing the categories around as if they're good enough. Bolt also brings up this other quote to justify why commodity production exists under communism. Under communism? You mean under socialism? On the other hand, nothing can pass into the ownership of individuals, except individual means of consumption. No individual can give anything except their labor? Well, yeah, welcome to the Soviet Union. What else could they give? Like, you, you see many private entrepreneurs in the Soviet Union? No! Okay, so dealing with the transitional phase and uh, statelessness. I have no idea where Finbol got this idea that Marx never talks about a transitional phase. Alright, maybe I wasn't being very clear. This is how you defined the transitional stage. Basically, as a mode of production which is the same as Stalin's Soviet Union. That was what you implied. You said it's a system where you have common ownership of the means of productions and the state plans everything but it's still capitalist because of commodity production. And because of that, I asked, do you think that this transitional phase has a mode of production of its own? As in, is it a totally new mode of production that Marx never talks about, but maybe you have invented? Or is it merely a capitalist mode of production? Because neither one of them really makes sense. Of course, there is a transition. I even said that Lenin's Soviet Union would be the transitional stage. You can't economically define the transitional stage, which is what you did. When Lenin was talking about the Soviet Union in, uh, in his time, in the new economic policy, he said that this is the last step before socialism. This is the last step before socialism. And he defined the mode of production at the time as being predominantly state capitalist. Maybe you just don't agree with Lenin, so maybe it's not worth it to use him as an example. 
But to me, it makes perfect sense when Lenin says that this is the last stage before socialism, but it's not a separate mode of production, it's just, it's predominantly state capitalist, and then when we have common ownership of the means of production, we have planned economy, we have socialism and stuff like that. We have the necessary industry and electricity and all that to make socialism possible. The way you were using the term transitional stage, you were basically just using it the same way that some ultra-lefts use state capitalism. And I thought it was intentional because it's almost become a meme and a joke to say like, oh, but it was state capitalist. So I thought, oh, this is a new one. Instead of just calling it state capitalist, they call it a transition stage. Just to make it sound different, but it's still the same old tired, not real socialism argument. Which, I mean, it still is just that tired old argument just a new spin on it. I just took issue with the fact that Marx never defines it the way you define it. Between capitalist and communist society, there lies a period of revolutionary transformation of one to the other. Honestly, did you even listen to what I said? The, the dictatorship of the proletariat is just the transition from capitalism to socialism. Well, he doesn't say that, he says communism. He says the transition period between capitalism and communism. Lower stage of communism is also a transition period, or a transition between capitalism and higher phase of communism. I also made that point that since everything here between those two, between capitalism and higher communism, everything between that is a transition. So that's why I thought it was just kind of weird that you would try to separate one part as uh, as being this transition period because everything in between that is a transition. It's obvious here that Marx is talking about the transition from capitalism to lower face communism and he refers to this as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Yeah, we know, we know. Like, you honestly think I don't know that? You can say that, like, this state capitalist, you know, whatever uh, new economic policy was a transition period from capitalism to lower communism and then various things you do in lower communism are a transition towards higher communism and then there's more and more of this transitioning and eventually you reach full communism. Everything between that is a transition period. I get that. I just think you totally missed my point. And I also want to use these quotes to back up my argument that communism is stateless. I want to know, do you have a source for this? Or is this just like your own pet theory? Because I think it might be. But if you have an actual literary source that makes it abundantly clear that socialism is stateless, then please give it to me. Is there like another Libcom article that talks about that? We can agree that any society that is classless must also be stateless. Because the state is only a tool of class struggle, and without any classes, there can be no class struggle. You're thinking about this extremely abstractly. In reality though, for example, like when Mao says that in socialism, there's no capitalist class anymore, there's just the workers, but why, why does he say that class struggle still continues in socialism? He says that because there's people who are ex-capitalists, who have a capitalist ideology, who want to make attempts at restoration. Internal class enemies, these kulaks, for example, who are not kulaks anymore because they have lost their private land, but they're ex-kulaks and they still want their land back. To me, it's just a stupid argument to say, well, if you just get rid of the classes, then there's not gonna be any struggle anymore. Like, I get it, it might sound a bit weird to say, like, you can have class struggle without classes, but if you take away the capitalist's property, like, all right, we expropriate the capitalist, do you think that he's just gonna surrender just like that, and he's never gonna make any attempts at restoration ever? No, of course not. They would love nothing as much as a counter-revolution where they can get their property back and they can become proper capitalists again. And I had a pretty funny exchange with this um, this one trot, or maybe, maybe they're left come, I don't know, but they told me that, well, if you still have ex-capitalists, you know, capitalists whose property has been taken away, they're still capitalists, so that's not really a classless society, checkmate Stalinist, I'm like, excuse me? How does Marxism define a class? Marxism defines a class based on its relation to the means of production. So if you don't own any means of production, you're not a capitalist. You can be an ex-capitalist though, but you're not really a capitalist. So in that sense, there's no classes, but there's still gonna be these ex-capitalists who are gonna try to do things, who are gonna try to make attempts at restoration. So class struggle continues. Not to mention that there's other countries which are hostile, capitalist countries, 
So I think your deduction fails here. Therefore, the state has no purpose, it doesn't exist. If you think the state has no purpose at that point, you are an idiot. Don't mean to be rude, but it's not correct to say that the state has no purpose. Marx clearly says that the dictatorship of the proletariat is a transition into a classless society. You say that as if that's supposed to mean something like, yeah, it is, of course. But you're saying that the dictatorship of the proletariat doesn't continue into socialism. I'm saying it does continue into socialism, it only ends when the state withers away. And the state withers away in full communism. You need to provide better proof for your claim, because what you're saying is, I would say, rather unorthodox. It's it's rather unique way of reading Marx. I had never even heard this before, until very recently. So if you're gonna put out this really weird new reading of Marx, then you need to justify it better. First quote, he just says from capitalism to communism, and of course to Marx there is no difference between socialism and communism. What do you mean? Of course there's a difference. There's lower phase of communism and higher phase of communism, and the lower phase is itself a transition. So when he's talking about a transition, you think like there's this period of transition, but then it stops like in the low communism. Well, how would that make any sense? Low, lower communism itself is part of the transition. I think you just haven't thought this through. Marx specifically meant higher phase communist society. He would have specified that. <sighs> to me, it would make more sense to say the exact opposite, that if he really meant the lower phase, then he would have specified that. But he just says, between capitalism and communism, the beginning and the end. Well, what is the end? The end is higher communism. The end is not lower communism. Lower communism is part of the transition. Marx points out that lower phase communism is classless, where in Critique of the Government Program, he says everybody is a worker just like everybody else. Garlic pointed this out that if lower stage of communism was already stateless, then that would mean that the withering away of the state would already happen before socialism. Just think about this in like practical terms. In socialism, you would expropriate the capitalists they would stop being capitalists, they would just be enemies, but they wouldn't be capitalists, and you would have a technically classless society. And then the withering away of the state can begin in the areas where it's possible, and as it becomes more and more possible, the state finally withers away, and then you get to higher communism. Ignoring theory for a second, on purely logical grounds, that just makes much more sense. And again, Instead of looking at some libcom commentary on Marx's critique of the Gotha program, I think you ought to look at Lenin's commentary on the critique of the Gotha program. This is what Lenin says. He's talking about two things. Marx is talking about the economic prerequisites of higher communism, and Engels is talking about the withering away of the state. So this is what Lenin says in relation to that. Quote, we fully appreciate the correctness of Engels' remarks, mercilessly ridiculing the absurdity of combining the words freedom and state. So long as the state exists, there is no freedom. When there is freedom, there will be no state. The higher phase of communist society. The economic basis for the complete withering away of the state is such a high state of development of communism at which the antithesis between mental and physical labor disappears, which cannot on any account be removed immediately by the mere expropriation of the capitalists. Unquote. So, at least Lenin clearly associates the withering away of the state with higher communism. And unless you have some kind of good reason or some kind of good solid proof, then I think you should drop this idea. I highly recommend Lenin's book because it's very clear and it talks about a bunch of other things, not just the critique of the Gotha program. It's a very interesting book. If you want to say that the state can exist without class, that's down to you to explain within the Marxist framework. but. The state arises from class struggle. If the worker expropriates the capitalist, that is a form of class struggle. The capitalist will then make attempts at restoration, that is also class struggle, hence the need for a state. This is partially why the state will wither away, why it's not abolished, because it is gradual. This kind of class struggle will gradually cease. I mean, unless you just round up all the capitalists and kill them all or something. They're still gonna be there in society, they're still gonna be there making attempts at restoration, and only gradually the state can wither away.
Jason said in his video that the surplus extracted from production was used to aid the people in a socialist manner or you know, whatever. But this admits that wage labor existed. No, it doesn't. What are you talking about? I mean, Jason is not Marx. You shouldn't necessarily use something that Jason says as, who knows, I might disagree with him. Now, in this particular case, I don't, but whatever. What does Marx say? Uh, this is like the third time I talk about this, but in the critique of the Gotha program, Marx says that the total social product is divided into the part that goes to the workers and then the surplus which is used to maintain production, repair broken machines, maintain social services. You know, exactly like Jason says, the surplus is used for the benefit of the society, not for the benefit of some capitalist. Wage labor is when labor power is so- It has nothing to do with wage labor. Besides, the Soviet Union didn't even have wage labor, so I just- this is just so irrelevant. Wage labor is when labor power is sold as a commodity. As Stalin so clearly states, quote, the system of wage labor no longer exists and labor power is no longer a commodity, end of quote. I even said this in my first video. Read Lenin's book, read Stalin's book, and you will get a more firm grasp of what we're saying. Now, as we have a planned economy here, uh, we might have things like price fixes leading to that. However, the point is, is that the cost of production, that value, exists in the first place. The fact that cost of production exists doesn't mean that it is wage labor. Cost of production will always exist. That is what it costs to produce something. What are you talking about? Cost of production. As if, at some point, it's just not gonna cost any specific amount to do something. Of course it is. It's the cost of production. And furthermore, to say that price fixes mean that it's not wage labor, I don't know what to tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. Nobody said that because we have a minimum wage, therefore it's no wage labor. Like, that's not an argument that anyone has made. You cannot have commodity production without wage labor for this reason. Commodity production and wage labor are not linked in this way. You can have a feudal artisan who employs absolutely no one produce commodities. What is this argument? If there's commodity production, therefore there must be wage labor. Or if one thing is a commodity, then everything must be a commodity. I, this, these arguments don't make any sense. You could have commodities being produced by slaves, but obviously in slavery you don't have wage labor. This is what it says in, in Capital. Now this is in one of the footnotes, so I don't know if Marx wrote this footnote or not, but at least in this footnote it says, quote, The capitalist epoch is therefore characterized by this, that labor power takes in the eyes of the laborer himself the form of a commodity which is his property. His labor consequently becomes wage labor. We associate wage labor with capitalism when somebody's work becomes a commodity. But we know that there's commodity production in other systems too, not just capitalism. Therefore, it just makes no sense to say where there's commodity production, there has to be wage labor and vice versa. It just doesn't make sense. In another part, Marx talks about the peasants. Quote, modern industry has a more revolutionary effect than elsewhere for this reason, that it annihilates the peasant, that bulwark of the old society, and replaces him with the wage laborer. Now, are you saying that a peasant doesn't make commodities? Of course he does. He makes commodities, but he's not a wage laborer. Marx was not a utopian. He didn't want to draw up an intricate plan of exactly what socialism would look like because he realized that it might not go the way he had imagined it. In fact, it would almost certainly not go exactly the way that anybody could imagine. He doesn't talk about exchange between collective farms because the socialism that he was describing and thinking about was set in the Western European industrialized countries. Now, some opportunists would use this as an excuse to say that socialism in non-Western countries is impossible, and I've seen this happen. However, although they almost entirely focused on the West, Marx and Engels did make this one comment about Russia, which I'm gonna read to you right now. Quote, In Russia, we find face-to-face -face with the rapidly flowering capitalist swindle and bourgeois property just beginning to develop, more than half the land owned in common by the peasants. Now the question is, can the Russian obshina though greatly undermined, yet a form of primeval common ownership of land, pass directly to the higher form of communist common ownership? Or, on the contrary, must it first pass through the same process of dissolution, such as constitutes the historical evolution of the West?" Unquote. 
Notice that they consider this primitive obshina communal ownership as common ownership of land. They don't call it capitalist collective property or something like that, the way left communists would, or the way Marx and Engels talk about joint stock companies. Marx and Engels don't speak about socialist foreign trade. Now, probably they didn't think this question was relevant in their time, as there were no socialist countries. It wasn't really a pertinent or relevant question. However, it is relevant for those actually building socialism. It's worth pointing out that Engels believed that revolution would begin in the Western countries, and sooner or later would spread to all industrial countries. But he doesn't answer this question. What should be done if the revolution only succeeds in one country? Especially if there is a protracted period like that. Now he doesn't talk about this in any great detail, or go into it that concretely, like why would he? But this is what he says. Quote, that the communist revolution will not merely be a national phenomenon, but must take place simultaneously in all civilized countries, that is to say, at least in England, America, France, and Germany. It will develop in each of these countries more or less rapidly, according as one country or the other has a more developed industry, greater wealth, a more significant mass of productive forces." Unquote. Now, just a little bit of context for this quote, because although he says simultaneously, he still implies that this is probably relatively gradual and might take a long time, because although he says communist revolution, he doesn't mean like, all right, let's get guns and do it. He means the entire process of the whole movement emerging and the slow build up to the revolution, which might take, you know, decades. As he says, it will develop in each of these countries more or less rapidly according to as which country has more industry and therefore more proletarians and stuff like that. So he doesn't literally mean that the revolutions in every country happen on the same day. He just means that the, this whole process, of course, happens in all of them, in all these capitalist countries equally, almost equally, because some of them are more industrialized than others. This quote reflects the classic old-school Marxist thought that the revolution would begin in the West, and it would begin in the countries that are most industrialized. Now, as Stalin points out, the formulation of Engels is outdated to the degree that it doesn't take into consideration uneven economic development or modern imperialism, and it doesn't even mention Russia. And why would it? Why should it? Because it was written in the 1840s. So, of course, it doesn't take those into account. So, Lenin says, quote, Uneven economic and political development is an absolute law of capitalism. Hence, the victory of socialism is possible first in several or even in one capitalist country alone. After expropriating the capitalists and organizing their own socialist production, the victorious proletariat of that country will arise against the rest of the world, the capitalist world, attracting to its cause the oppressed classes of other countries." Unquote. Lenin's formulation is a modern and practical formulation of what Engels is saying. Is the communist revolutionary process a global phenomena? Yes, absolutely. But do revolutions happen in individual countries? Yes, they do, obviously. After the revolution has happened in one country, it will sooner or later happen in another country, and another, and another, and it will spread, leading to a global struggle of two global camps. One world capitalist camp, and one world socialist camp. Stalin put this in the following way, quote, The victory of socialism is possible in separate countries, thus envisaging the prospect of the formation of two parallel centers of attraction, the center of world capitalism and the center of world socialism. End of quote. So, Marx and Engels do not speak of socialist foreign trade, and when asked about this, the opportunists Instead of approaching this question boldly and honestly to solve it, they retreat further from it, saying, Socialism is only possible globally, this question doesn't need to be dealt with. But this doesn't mean anything. It's an empty phrase. Lenin says, quote, When we are told that the victory of socialism is possible only on a world scale, we regard this merely as an attempt, a particularly hopeless attempt, on the part of the bourgeoisie and its voluntary and involuntary supporters to distort the irrefutable truth." Unquote. And, quote, since the bourgeoisie has been overthrown in one country, the second task is to wage the struggle on a world scale. Unquote. We understand that the communist revolutionary process happens globally in general, and in specific countries in particular. 
Both theory and history have proven this. The opportunists who say it wasn't real socialism because socialism can only happen globally are exactly that, opportunists. You can always retreat back to these vague, meaningless phrases if you don't want to deal with the specific and concrete real-world circumstances. But that is not Marxism, that is the opposite of Marxism. But, I mean, that is why they call them armchairs. Now, what was the actual reasoning for what should be done regarding commodity production? Stalin says, quote, In anti-during, Engels speaks of mastering all the means of production, of taking possession of all the means of production. Hence, Engels has in mind the nationalization not of part, but of all the means of production. That is, the conversion into public property, the means of production not only of industry, but also of agriculture. But here is a question. What are the proletariat and its party to do in countries, ours being a case in point, where the conditions are favorable for the assumption of power by the proletariat and the overthrow of capitalism, where capitalism has so concentrated the means of production in industry that they may be expropriated and may be the property of society, but where agriculture, notwithstanding the growth of capitalism, is divided up among numerous small and medium owner-producers to such an extent as to make it impossible to consider the expropriation of these producers. To this question Engels's formula does not furnish an answer. Incidentally, it was not supposed to furnish an answer, since the formula arose from another question, namely, what should be the fate of commodity production after all the means of production have been socialized? Unquote. Engels says that after all the means of production are nationalized, it should be possible to abolish commodity production. Because of this, Stalin developed a plan both to raise collective farms to the status of public property, as well as paving the way for the abolition of commodity production. He says, quote, In order to pave the way for a real and not declaratory transition to communism, it is necessary by means of gradual transitions carried out to the advantage of the collective farms and, hence of all society, to raise collective farm property to the level of public property and also by means of gradual transitions to replace commodity circulation by a system of products exchange under which the central government or some other social economic center might control the whole product of social production in the interest of society." End of quote. Now, I want to stress that, first of all, in response to this whole collective farm discussion, I won't accept the answer that, eh, but socialism is not possible in peasant countries. Fuck you, all right? Just, that is the height of opportunism, all right? Whenever some kind of problem arises, you can't just say, well, it's not possible, let's not do it. There's always going to be some kind of problem that's going to be there, and then you just got to deal with it. You can't blame reality for not conforming to your pre-planned utopian ideas. You gotta make the theory fit the reality, not the other way around. And I wanna stress that this collective farm discussion, this collective farm problem, if you will, is an entirely new problem. It is not merely the problem of nationalization, because you can't nationalize them. In capitalism, you could maybe wait for 200 years or something to allow the market to centralize all the land and all the farming implements and everything to be centralized into the hands of a few capitalists who could then be expropriated. But the Enclosure Act and all the things that happened in the Industrial Revolution in the West were horrendous. It's horrible for the people, but it's also not practical and it's not in any way applicable to socialism. So you have to figure out a different way of bringing the farm plots into universal public property. And the collective farm is a very good idea. And then this kind of idea of linking up the collective farms and stuff is exactly the kind of idea that we need. The point that I'm trying to make is that you can't really just copy the West. You can't really force the situation to become such that Engels' formula of nationalizing everything becomes perfectly applicable. We get the meaning of Engels' formula. It is that they need to be public property for commodity production to be abolished. But we need to be a bit creative about how we're going to make that happen. He continues, quote, The problem of the disappearance of distinctions between town industry and country agriculture and between physical and mental labor, this problem was not discussed in the Marxist classics. It is a new problem, one that has been raised practically by our socialist construction. Is this problem an imaginary one? On the contrary, it is for us a problem of the greatest seriousness, 
whereas in industry we have public ownership of the means of production and of the product of industry. In agriculture we have not public but group collective farm ownership." Unquote. Zegzizi spoke of collective capitalist property, but this is not at all what collective farms are. Furthermore, it's rather ridiculous and confused to call the USSR state capitalist for having collective farm common property, since you would be calling it state capitalist that there are things the state doesn't own. Which doesn't make any sense. Collective farm property has to be called socialist property, no matter how much you want to squirm out of this, but it has to be called socialist property because it is common ownership of the means of production which are directly in the hands of the workers. You would think that that is what socialism is all about, right? It is not the same as capitalist property of any kind. Besides, I don't think I've ever seen a capitalism, state capitalism or otherwise, without the profit motive. But in the Soviet Union, profitableness was only a budget indicator or a economic planning indicator, not the sole motivator or the sole incentive of the economy the way it is in capitalism. And for this reason, among others, the state capitalist label just doesn't fit. Quote, Totally incorrect, too, is the assertion that under our present economic system, in the first phase of development of communist society, the law of value regulates the proportions of labor distributed among the various branches of production. If this were true, it would be incomprehensible why our light industries, which are the most profitable, are not being developed to the utmost, and why preference is given to our heavy industries, which are often less profitable and sometimes altogether unprofitable. It would be incomprehensible why a number of our heavy industry plants, which are still unprofitable, and where the labor of the worker does not yield the proper returns, are not closed down, and why new light industry plants, which would certainly be profitable, and where the labor of the workers might yield big returns, are not opened. Why workers are not being transferred from plants that are less profitable, but very necessary to our national economy, to plants which are more profitable in accordance with the law of value." Unquote. This is a rhetorical question, of course he knows the reason. The reason is obviously that the production was not based on profit, it was based on the long-term well-being and development of society as a whole. He goes on to say that it is much more socially profitable in the long term to give tractors for free to the collective farms, even though it might seem like really unprofitable, which it is, but it's socially beneficial and socially very necessary, for example, to solve the food problem. Famine and scarcity could be very profitable. It would surely raise the food prices, but because they wanted to solve the crisis of not having enough food, they were like, yeah, just give them tractors for free to boost production. Like, that makes perfect sense, right? If you want to solve the food problem, not if you want to make money. The reason why the Soviet Union didn't abolish all commodity exchange is because they had collective farms which owned their own product, and hence it had to be exchanged with the rest of society, because they had foreign trade, foreign exchange at least, and because they distributed means of consumption according to payment. Only an opportunist would say that this is not in accordance with Marx and Engels. Engels says commodity production can only be abolished when all means of production are nationalized. Hence, while some of them are only collective socialist property and not public socialist property, exchange is both acceptable and necessary. Quote, Society, by taking possession of all means of production, and using them on a planned basis has freed itself and all its members from the bondage in which they are now held by these means of production. With the seizing of the means of production by society, production of commodities is done away with." Unquote. Marx says in the Critique of the Gotha Program, quote, The social working day consists of the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual labor time of the individual producer is the part of the social working day contributed by him, his share in it. The same amount of labor which he has given to society in one form, he receives back in another." Unquote. That is, individuals will be paid and then can purchase means of consumption in accordance with how much useful labor they perform. On the basis of this, the Soviet Constitution says, quote, Article 12. The principle applied in the USSR is that of socialism, from each according to his ability to each according to his work. Unquote they will receive according to their work as opposed to according to their need, because as Marx explains, 
in the lower phase of communism or socialism, workers will get things according to their work and in the higher phase of communism according to their need. But the opportunist will argue that this is entirely different from what Marx had in mind and not real socialism because the USSR still had exchange. While, of course, it is entirely and obviously created on the basis of what Marx said, Marx never set out to create a utopian plan for exactly how socialism would happen. He understood that he could not foresee all the complications that would arise. The fact that the revolution didn't succeed in the West, but in Russia and then in China, are perfect examples of this. So, how would the socialist transformation in a country such as Soviet Russia happen? Stalin paraphrases Lenin to answer this question. Quote, Lenin's answer may be briefly summed up as follows. A. Favorable conditions for the assumption of power should not be missed. The proletariat should assume power without waiting until capitalism has succeeded in ruining the millions of small and medium individual producers. B. The means of production in industry should be expropriated and converted into public property. C. As to the small and medium individual producers, they should be gradually united in producers' cooperatives, that is, in large agricultural enterprises, collective farms. D. Industry should be developed to the utmost, and the collective farms should be placed on the modern technical basis of large-scale production, not expropriating them, but on the contrary, generously supplying them with first-class tractors and other machines. E. In order to ensure an economic bond between town and country, between industry and agriculture, commodity production, exchange through purchase and sale, should be preserved for a certain period it being the form of economic tie with the town which is alone acceptable to the peasants. And Soviet trade, state, cooperative and collective farm should be developed to the full, and the capitalists of all types and descriptions ousted from trading activity. The history of socialist construction in our country has shown that this path of development, mapped out by Lenin, has fully justified itself. There can be no doubt that in the case of all capitalist countries, with a more or less numerous class of small and medium producers, this path of development is the only possible and expedient one for the victory of socialism." Unquote. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about the definition of socialism. An interesting thing I've noticed is that Zegzizi and the left communists seem to have a rather Stalinist conception of socialism. They see socialism not so much as a new system, but merely the stamping out of aspects of capitalism. In my opinion, this is a mistake, to a degree in Stalin's thought, but even more so in that of the left communists. Marx was a scientist, and Marxism should be approached as a science. For that reason, we ought to have a clear and scientific understanding. And for one, that means that we should look at things concretely and specifically, and not just always resort to abstractions and meaningless phrases. We all acknowledge in words that socialism is merely a transition system. Quote, still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society, unquote, as Marx says. But some people don't seem to take this to heart. We can act like utopians, and draw up plans about what ideal socialism would look like and stuff like that, but in reality, nothing is ever ideal, and nothing is ever pure. Nothing is ever 100% one thing and 0% another thing. Nothing is ever 100% good and 0% bad or 100% new and 0% old. Anybody who advocates historical materialism ought to realize this. In a brief comment exchange with someone, I gave this thought experiment. If a country is what we define as entirely socialist, but then one man sets up a private lemonade stand, does the country now stop being socialist and become capitalist? Maybe in a ultra-hardline Stalinist conception, this is a threatening outbreak of capitalism, but ironically, we Marxist-Leninists seem to have a less Stalinist conception, one that has developed purely out of practice, experience and observation. In the Soviet Union, the collective farmers could own their own home. They could also own a garden plot. Now, I can already hear the left communists screaming about this, but is this really capitalism? Obviously not. These gardens have practically no economic significance. Barely any, just like the one private lemonade stand. It would be the most absurd and totalitarian thing ever to ban these gardens.
And if right now in your mind you're saying, but they're private property, they're private gardens, they must be collectivized or something, that means that you really are operating under an extremely Stalinist conception of what socialist means. And when I say Stalinist, Stalin was pretty practical about this. He was extremely practical about how to make socialism happen. But he still had this tendency of merely seeing socialism as a negation of capitalism, which is demonstrated in an extreme form by certain left communists. A similar conversation to this was being had when Cuba chose to allow small private enterprise like private ice cream sellers, private taxi drivers, things like that. Now, I'm not saying that this is without any problems. Of course, it can lead to problems. But what I am saying is that the idea of banning private selling of ice cream because it is an element of capitalism kind of misses the point of socialism. And the Cuban government decided that it was not worth the trouble to do it. Of course, a question like this, an imperfection like this, a complication like this, would never even arise in the fairy tale daydreams of the utopian left communist, who at least implicitly thinks that everything is just going to go smoothly, exactly the way it says in books written like 150 years ago. And even saying that would be unfair to Marx, because these left communists are twisting Marx's words to say a certain thing, and then they say that reality has to correspond exactly to that, and if it doesn't, then reality is wrong. Not that their opinions are wrong, or their uh, twisted interpretation of Marx is wrong. Okay, so how is this definition question relevant to our present discussion? It's relevant because Zegzizi and the left communists claim that a country where the means of production are either socialist state property, or socialist collective farm property, or cooperative property, that has planned economy and no profit motive, is capitalism. Why do they say it's capitalism? Because it has elements of the old system. That is literally it. Because they haven't stamped them all out yet. And then they go and make their definitions specifically in such a way that elements which the rest of us would associate with full communism, such as moneylessness or statelessness or something, they associate with lower communism, so that they can then say, look, they were not stateless, therefore not real communism. But anybody who is even remotely objective can look at the Soviet Union and see that it was socialist. The point is that the Soviet Union was predominantly socialistic, because elements of the old can coexist with the elements of the new, and that doesn't mean that it was merely a transition stage or something, because everything in this sense is a transition. You will always have the old, and you will always have the new. The Soviet Union had some remnants of the old, like commodity exchange, but they also had elements of the present, planned economy, socialist, public industry, and stuff like that. But they also had some elements of the future, such as the fact that the tractors were given to the collective farmers for free, according to need. The capitalistic elements and the old elements, which still inevitably remain in the lower stage of communism, were limited and subservient to the new socialist system. To return to the private lemonade stand example, how much of the means of production would have to be socialized before the country becomes socialist? Now, we don't really know, and Marx never bothers to talk about this, as it is a rather ridiculous question. He just says that means of production are owned in common, but he doesn't talk about what if there's still one guy who is like privately selling flowers on the street or something, is it now capitalism? We all understand the absurdity of making such a claim. Now, probably 51% common ownership and 49% private ownership is probably not enough, right? We would probably say that that's not enough. When the Soviet Union, uh, they had the collectivization of agriculture movement, which lasted for 10 years, at which point would you say that agriculture was now collectivized? It's kind of impossible to say, right? Because it took 10 years, which means that even though they already had like 40% or 50% collectivization pretty early on, for 10 years they still continued to have some people who owned a small shitty private plot. And after 10 years, practically all of them were collective. It was still not illegal to own a private plot, by the way. 
of course, the the small producers can't realistically, you know, compete or realistically survive. Just like they can't survive against big-scale capitalist production, it's just so inefficient and horrible that they're just gonna die out, you know? After those small plots die out, nobody's gonna go out and say, like, oh, right, I'm gonna get my plow and my horse and gonna go back to the way it was. No, nobody's gonna go back. When discussing the new economic policy, Lenin said, Quote, the term Soviet Socialist Republic implies the determination of the Soviet power to achieve the transition to socialism. What does the word transition mean? Does it not mean, as applied to an economy, that the present system contains elements, particles, fragments of both capitalism and socialism? Everyone will admit that it does, but not all who admit this take the trouble to consider what elements actually constitute the various socio-economic structures that exist in Russia at the present time, and this is the crux of the question, unquote. I bring this up because I think it's pretty fascinating. He then goes on to go through the most notable of these various coexisting elements in um, the new economic policy. Quote, Let us enumerate these elements. 1. Patriarchal or natural or pre-capitalist subsistence farming. 2. Small commodity production. This includes the majority of those peasants who sell their grain. 3. Private capitalism. 4. State capitalism. 5. Socialism. Russia is so vast and so varied that all these different types of socio-economic structures are intermingled. This is what constitutes the specific feature of the situation. End of quote. Lenin came to the conclusion that the dominant modes of production were state capitalism and private small capitalism in industry, and small commodity production and subsistence economy in agriculture. Based on this, he suggests cooperative farming, collective farms, large-scale exchange between town and country, and industrialization. He said, quote, state capitalism, not terrible, but desirable, and, quote, State monopoly capitalism is a complete material preparation for socialism. The threshold of socialism, a rung on the ladder of history, between which and the rung called socialism, there are no intermediate rungs." Unquote. In 1923, Lenin said in response to the opportunists, quote, As certain learned gentlemen among them put it, the objective economic premises for socialism do not exist in our country. Quote, the development of the productive forces of Russia has not yet attained the level that makes socialism possible, unquote. You say that civilization is necessary for building socialism. Very good. But why could we not first create prerequisites of civilization in our country by the repulsion of the landowners and the Russian capitalists and then start moving towards socialism? Where, in what books, have you read that such sequence of events are impermissible or impossible, unquote. To me, this so brilliantly sums up the attitude that we should have towards the people who say, we don't have to talk about international trade because socialism will be global. What if it doesn't become global right away? How would that even happen? It's never gonna happen like that. It's never gonna happen like that. What next? You're gonna say, we don't need to talk about the abolition of commodity production in socialism because in my definition of socialism, it's not supposed to have exchange. Like, well, how does it get to not have exchange? It has to be abolished somehow. And you can't say, well, socialism is only possible in the Western industrial countries where the peasantry doesn't exist. That is not an acceptable answer. And Lenin uses the term certain learned gentlemen, but I, if we translate this to modern rhetoric, we would call them armchairs. These backseat drivers of revolution who never do anything except make pointless, unconstructive criticism and whine about why things never go the way they want them to go. He also says, quote, The political power of the Soviet over all large-scale means of production, the power in the state in the hands of the proletariat, the alliance of this proletariat with the many millions of small and very small peasants, the assured leadership of the peasantry by the proletariat, etc., is this not all that is necessary in order from the cooperatives to build a complete socialist society? This is not yet the building of socialist society, but it is all that is necessary and sufficient for this building. End of quote. Now, he said that in 1923, in the new economic policy, 
Now, based on these plans put forward by Lenin, based on the concrete conditions of Russia, the Soviet Union created socialism by implementing economic planning, abolishing private ownership of the means of production, taking industry in the hands of the state and the workers, and putting farmland and machines in the hands of the collective farmers and the state farm workers. Only an opportunist would look at this and say that is merely capitalism doing its thing, or that this is not real socialism, because that is precisely what it is. Real socialism, and not imaginary, non-existent socialism.